Um, Mary, would you like to uh, yes. lead us, lead us out? <laughs> yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the opening program for Stasis and Comfort, a virtual gallery hosted by Unbound Visual Arts. My name is Mary. Uh, I'm an intern here at UVA. And so I'll be moderating this program. So any questions you have, we'll answer some questions at the end. So make sure to put any questions or comments down in the chat so I can read them off and the artists can answer. Um, if we're ready to get started, I can introduce the artists. So Chelsea White is a painter and illustrator originally from Bangor, Maine. She migrated down to the North Shore to attend Gordon College in Denham, and since earning her bachelor's in visual arts in 2012, she stuck around the rural area as much as possible since then. She spent seven years in Beverly, where whenever she wasn't working, she would be exploring the surrounding towns and neighborhoods on her bicycle and making art. However, it has only been since her move to her current location in Salem, New Hampshire, which coincided fairly closely with the start of the pandemic, that she fell in love with using gouache and painting in plein air to express the love for the town she felt in her art. Since making this discovery, she has shifted much of her art from previous favorite subjects towards portraits of spaces as showcased in today's show to combat the mental and emotional difficulties of a year and a half of quarantine. Almost every painting in this gallery stems from many trips back to Boston and over North Shore cities, which inspired her for so long to begin with. And the other artist today will be showing her photographs and that's Kyung Lee. She graduated with a master's degree from Rhode Island School of Design in Global Arts and Cultures. And she also has a bachelor's from UC Berkeley in art. After graduating from Berkeley, Kyung worked as a museum educator. She is currently working at UVA as the virtual exhibition designer for and the curator for the upcoming exhibit, Teaching Children About Racial Justice. So I think Chelsea, if you wanted to take the lead on the gallery and do your thing. Sure. Um, yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> it really means a lot to see everyone here. Um, I also want to thank John Cotrolli and everyone with Unbound Visual Arts for hosting this gallery and setting up this reception today. Uh, I'm really honored. I can't wait to talk with you all and answer any questions you have. Uh, like Mary said, my name is Chelsea White. I'm an artist based out of Salem, New Hampshire. Um, I have a bachelor's in visual art from Gordon College. And as you can see, I also have a strong natural affinity for all things related to uh, old traditional New England uh, sort of aesthetic architecture. A lot of my loved ones for years now have been very used to being out in public with me somewhere and having to like, stop and turn around because they realize that I've glued my myself in place somewhere, uh, just taking in the way that like a light in a street lamp reflects onto a window and a curtain or something. Um, they usually know they have to give me a minute before they can carefully tear me away uh, so that we can get where we're actually going and hope on my behalf that uh, no one is judging me for staring at someone else's home or workspace. Um, yes. Um, Mary, did you have some questions? Uh, yeah. Well, we have some questions here. So, what inspired you to begin making paintings like these? Um, so, uh, it's not. I'd say it's not always easy to say why the spaces of the North Shore uh, inspire me so strongly. But I know that I started really focusing on kind of the positive feelings they gave me um, as the pandemic and all these political events also have happened over the last year and a half um, in, as a sort of direct response to those to kind of combat those feelings. Um, I've always been kind of scared to put down what I see on paper, um, but there's so much character packed into the walls and streets of the North Shore towns. Um, almost like, it, I, I almost feel like they've been asking me to, to try to put them down on paper. Um, and as the pandemic progressed with the mass scale devastation, kind of turning into this global train wreck in a way, uh, it, kind of put, it kind of pushed me out of a very soul sucking job and gave me time to finally sit and paint uh, things that I really wanted to portray. 
um, which the result is largely what you see here. Um, none of that was possible while working full time, unfortunately. Um, painting became very cathartic in response to COVID-19 uh, because it felt like the only thing I could do in a time when uh, I was feeling both very aimless and uh, very tired uh, emotionally. Uh, when I discovered gouache as a medium, it was a very powerful moment that ended in a decade long string of always experimenting with virtually every other medium. Uh, there is, I, I've tried like oil, acrylic, watercolor, stenciling, collage, watercolor pencils, Crayola markers, pretty much anything. Um, I finally rounded my way back to gouache um, after a, a brief negative impression of it years ago. Uh, I found them after trying plain air with other mediums like colored pencils, which are very versatile in a lot of ways, um, but they're not great for doing what I was trying to do because you need to be able to make like big swaths of color at once. Um, and I didn't like watercolor because I don't really jive well with how it's always transparent. Um, so I was struggling a little bit and I joined a Facebook group uh, of plein air painters and I kind of asked them for tips on getting started. Uh, someone pointed me to James Gurney, um, who if you don't know him is just an absolute god of the modern paint, plein air painting scene. Uh, and he frequently uses gouache because it's very similar to watercolor, watercolor in a lot of ways, but it has it's much more opaque, which I appreciated as soon as I realized. Um, uh, James Gurney has this big library of videos on YouTube detailing his process in the field. Uh, they're educational, they're really interesting, and he has that same sort of calming effect on you as like Bob Ross and what he's famous for, um, because they're both very like soft-spoken and easygoing. Um, so I, I highly recommend checking out his YouTube channel because he always has some very cool stuff. Um, I at, back at the time, back in like April of last year, I started watching one video and then the other and the other and the other and soon I was hooked. Um, and I started thinking to myself like, oh, I can do this. And uh, you know, nothing's ever as easy as it looks, I would say, as when a professional's doing it. Um, but it got me to kind of break the ice into that medium, if you will. Oh yeah, thank you very much for asking. Um. Awesome, thank you for answering. Um, we have another question. So how do you choose the places that you sit and paint? Can you let us in on your process? Sure, um, I'd say when it comes to actually painting, I kind of have this loose like mental catalog of a lot of places around me where I've gone in the past and I've had to stop and admire them. Uh, most of the time, I don't always know what specific thing catches my eye. It might be like, the shadow of a brick house on a city street or like withered old paint on an old house um, or a little like reading lamp clamped to like a host's stand in like a dim restaurant. Uh, these, they're arbitrary, but they give me a really intense emotional reaction. Um, part of what held me back for so long, I'd say was not being able to explain that to myself. Uh, and if that sounds like a silly reason to hold yourself back, it probably is, but it was a factor. Um, at some point, I was able to kind of move past that not understanding why and just force myself to acknowledge this makes me happy and I want to capture it. Um, I will usually embark for one of these places on a day where I have a few hours free and the weather's compliant. I'll try to set up as best I can. And I'll usually work about one to three hours. Uh, usually I'll have to take a picture for reference because um, I'll usually have to finish up at home. Um, and the lighting that's present when I first get there is normally the lighting that I wanna capture. Uh, and it's very, you know, lighting can be very finicky in nature uh, and I don't wanna lose it uh, over that like one or two or three hour period. Uh, there are a lot of practical concerns to take into consideration like that, like, um, and they kind of become part of the puzzle almost that needs solving for the painting to happen. Um, like I mentioned the weather, like, will it be hot or cold? Will it be really sunny? Um, will it rain? Will the wind wreak havoc? Uh, is there good parking nearby also? Uh, uh, if the painting 
heavily depends on a certain lighting situation, I try to jot down the most important details that capture that lighting very quickly because, you know, like I said, it'll change after just a few moments. Um, uh, uh, lately, medium-wise, I've transitioned from using Bristol paper to watercolor paper, which is good and sturdy. Um, I've been using Holbein brand uh, acrylic gouache paints, they're called, which is a form of gouache paint that doesn't reactivate, so to speak, when, when it turns wet again. Um, so I appreciate that a lot because I do a lot of layering. Um, in the past, I would have started with a loose sketch because my natural inclination is to try to get everything perfect like the perspective, the shapes, the placements, um, but that I find that kind of robs the joy out of the process. So lately I've been just trying to make myself start with just paint um, right from the beginning. Um, and that I think speeds things up. Uh, I try to kind of block off big chunks of like thin transparent colors of layers of color uh, just to get as much paper covered as I can. Um, and try to work big to small. Uh, everything I do uh, on site is done in one go. Um, I'll try to have everything done at once, but sometimes it'll have to be done a few days after that in the studio. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for asking. And then we just have, so we have a couple of, we have a question in the chat, but we can answer that now, or do you wanna wait until like a Q and A portion? um up to you guys as artists and audience um maybe maybe we can do like a combined q a for like whatever questions people have for kyung and me towards the end okay uh, i i don't know like how uh how you feel about that kyung or uh john if you have any uh uh advice on that yeah let's do it later yeah that would be great. Uh, OK. And then, so I just have one other question um, for Chelsea. So you mentioned earlier that you found painting to be cathartic during COVID-19. And how so? Like, how are the two connected for you? Thank you. Um, I'd say, uh, I, I pers on a personal level, I feel very often kind of consumed with the sort of mental hubbub that I think a lot of people experience a lot in their uh, adult years. Uh, in particular, not purely just from this, but it has certainly intensified since COVID began, um, where it's, you know, it's this, the continuous struggle that I think a lot of people face of living, trying to live in the moment uh, as much as you can. Um, it kind of compounds some like the, like the mental and emotional health issues um, I've struggled with over the last you know number of years, um, which for all the ways in which I've tried to cope with them and improve them, um, like with you know self care and sometimes like therapy things like that. Uh, making art usually is the most surefire means I found for creating like a clarity in my head, like that cathartic sense of a clear purpose. Um, I'd say. Making art is very empowering for me. And that's what kind of keeps drawing me back to it. Uh, these points of inspiration that I talked about earlier, like admiring real world, real world beauty around me, uh, sort of zap me back into my body and make me pay attention to my senses. Uh, they kind of like anchor me in the moment and give me that almost existential realization of, oh, holy cow, like I'm alive and conscious. That's crazy. Um, it by no means is the only thing that can do that for me. Um, like time spent with uh, loved ones um, or, or, you know, animals and pets can give that to me a lot of the time, I'd say. Um, but there is something special about the moments I'm describing that kind of unify the, my awe at life's inevitable beauty with my need to express it artistically. Um, and that's what I found plein air is so perfect for. Um, and that's also why I'd say I'm grateful beyond words to have had this opportunity in my adult life. I tried for years to balance and working full time, like I mentioned, while making art as much as possible, like on weekends. But a lot of the, those years that I did spend trying to do that were felt kind of aimless. I think I only made like a couple of 
finished painting out paintings I was proud of during my 20s, especially because um, I never had a chance to ease out of that constant state of worrying that I wasn't being you know, productive enough or that I wasn't making enough money to reliably pay for necessities. Um, and then about six months before COVID came to the United States, I moved in with my partner and uh, that liberating moment of realizing I didn't need to, uh, I didn't depend on keeping a particularly miserable job full time um, was really liberating and something I, I, I wish for all, all artists and all creatives, um, because I'm sure most, almost all of us have struggled with that same thing. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do what's in the gallery today without the support of my loved ones. Um, one of, uh, once that material opportunity became available to me, I also had to force myself into that mental shift from the highly capitalist mindset that says, you're relaxing, you're not working, you're not being productive, what are you doing? You have to, you must contribute, um, which was its own little battle because I think it's kind of ingrained into us as Americans that we should always be working, always be productive, uh, even to the point that it's kind of starts to harm us. Um, I think it, uh, it's hurtful as a creative because the art, the, act of making art isn't productive in the sense of the rest of life's work. And I think that's why a lot of people dismiss it as frivolous, even though any creative can tell you that it's preposterous to think of it that way. Um, but um, I'd say not having the chance to really uh, paint has magically healed all of that. But I'd say, uh, um, for the first time in ages, um, I've started to feel more myself again. Like I've been given that, that back, that, that space back. I feel my art has finally had room to just exist because I've been able to let go of survival mode, which is possibly a little ironic because it's, that comes as the re direct result of the pandemic. Yeah, thank you very much, Mary. Awesome, thank you. Um, so if you wanna take the screen, you can screen share into the gallery so we can take a look at some of your works and then you can like, explain what's going on and your what pieces mean to you and everything. Yes, definitely. Uh, let's see here. Okay, can everyone see this? Can? Yes. Well, actually not quite yet, but it's gonna, it's gonna start in a second. Yes. Oh, good. okay. Everyone good? Alrighty. So I'm going to hit enter exhibition. Um, so this, uh, everyone is free to, you know, come and explore the gallery on their, uh, on their own terms, their own time. Um, it's on unboundvisualarts.org. Um, they created a page for this exhibit. And if you navigate to uh, that page on unboundvisualarts.org, there's a link at the top where you can enter this and just kind of um, putts around a little bit, if you will. Um, we've kind of got it divided into two rooms. Um, this is this is my, my arts room when you first enter it. And then you can kind of see the doorway on your left is where uh, Kyung's photography is. Um, I've got 12 works in all. I've got two smaller paintings over here on one side which are the only two paintings I've ever done in the town that I actually live in, uh, which is Salem, New Hampshire. I'm, I kind of tend to think of Salem, New Hampshire as like not being very pretty because I'm so used to like Salem, Massachusetts, for example, which is very different from it. It's like very, very, very rich and um, just like artistically designed um, and old, um, but uh, I can I can show those couple ones in a minute. Um, I've got 10 paintings lined up along this wall. And if Kuhn's Matrix will comply, I can zoom into a couple and talk a little bit about two or three of them. Uh, so this is this is a good example of one. This is 
uh, Cogswell's Grant uh, Barn Interior, um, which is for sale on the UVA website as well. Um, and you can also get a better, closer look at it there. Um, this is on the property of a historic New England farm and museum called, uh, called Cogswell's Grant in Essex. Uh, it's managed by Historic New England. It's open to the public, um, which I really, I really appreciate. Um, I'd happened to actually see it in the middle of browsing uh, potential wedding venues online. Um, I'd found pictures of this place just on Google Maps, and it caught my eye initially because you know, we were looking for like a wedding venue that had that same old New England flavor of like old barns, old buildings, old trees. Um, and I realized I wanted to come here and paint it. Um, I didn't realize it was about an hour drive each way, but it was still very much worth it. Um, the sunlight was fading pretty quickly that day. So I had to set up quickly. Um, I broke out this beautiful new French easel that I'd been given uh, for Christmas, uh, which was a little intimidating in a way. Like it, I don't know, something about setting up and having an easel and looking all like official was, uh, it made me feel a little self-conscious at first, but at the same time, it was perfect for this. Um, I had planned on maybe painting the other direction from inside the barn, which, uh, was like, you know, would have pointed out towards the big barn door, the open barn door. Um, but I saw the sunlight kind of spilling through these planks in the wall, like what you see. Um, and underneath these kind of like loose top hinge sliding doors onto the haystacks, there's all the sunlight coming through, all the cracks in the boards and the walls. And that was, that was one of those moments that I described earlier that really captivated me. Um, the other thing that kind of drew me to stay here and paint was the barn smell. I, and I really wish that there was some way for me to like bottle up that smell and have it be a part of the experience of like looking at the painting, um, either virtually or in person. I know it's not possible, but it would be great. Um, it's very, that it's a very unique, very musty smell. Um, it's very reminiscent of the barn that was attached to the old New England farmhouse I grew up in when I was very small. Um, so it gives me a lot of nostalgia and it kind of gives me some sense of uh, identity because it kind of reminds me of how I grew up um, because I loved being raised in that farmhouse that it reminded me of it and like having a lot of adventures there. Um, and it also reminds me of uh, working with horses, which when I, when I get the opportunity to, I will do uh, whenever possible. Um, let's see, let me navigate away from that and find a different one. Um, at the center of this half of the room over here, is this painting is called at the intersection of Salem Street and Prince Street, which is in the North End. And the North End is just prime real estate in terms of the sort of things that attract me to sit there and paint. Um, uh, this day, I remember very vividly every time I look at this painting, I, I parked in Sullivan Square, and, which is in Somerville, and because the parking there was cheaper and you didn't have to move after two hours, you could stay there all day. And uh, I'm very thrifty by nature, so I'll take that any day. Um, I then got on my bike, slung my rucksack with my painting supplies uh, over my shoulder with my folding chair. I like I slathered, I had to slather myself in sunscreen because it was a very sunny day. And I biked Route 99 from Sullivan Square to kind of the, uh, the North Station area of Boston. Which, uh, which was a little bit dangerous, but it was fun. Um, I think this was like a Monday or Tuesday because there were almost no tourists that day, which is very unusual for the North End. The North End is very tourist heavy a lot of the time. Um, there's just like a lot of work crews, like, you know, getting like painting or roofing or electrical work done and locals and like some dog walkers. Um, and it was also, it was trash day that day that I went. And you could tell because like, there were big bags of trash everywhere and it actually smelled horrible. 
Um, but um, the, the North End is so gorgeous. It's I, I honestly didn't care. Um, all these buildings date back to at least 1900, I'd say. They're all crafted with care. They're all like, you can tell they're all like raised and made by hand, and yet they're still like packed and tight against each other. Um, and a lot of them have these orioles they're called, or like these big unified columns of like bay windows that stick out um, that are made out of copper. And over the decades, they've been like stained with, they've been stained black with smog a lot of the time. And then they start to patina. And that leaves like this running, dripping pattern in, in like bright green that you've probably seen if you've ever been around the North End before. And I just, I go gaga for that. I love that look. Um, and this building that caught my eye, my eye had uh, lots of these. Um, and I wanted to try to capture that. Uh, in retrospect, I probably should have done a detail painting of just this facet of the building if I wanted to catch that, because this perspective is a little too far away to get that done effectively. Um, but I'm still fairly happy with the way it came out. Um, I tried to kind of park my bike and sit where I was out of the way of passersby on the corner. Uh, but like, you know, these sidewalks are like old granite sidewalks from the 19th century and they're not uh, what we're used to elsewhere. They're stone and they're very steep and they're very narrow. And the streets are the same way. The streets are all one way in this area. Um, I'm sure the brick pavement is still under the asphalt from back in the time of, you know, horse and buggy. Uh, so I squeezed myself in here and on multiple occasions, I actually had to like stand up and stand flush against the building on the corner behind me because there were these big vans coming through to work on projects in the neighborhood that already didn't fit on the street. And they had to take this hard left turn that came so close that the like their tires would come up on the sidewalk directly in front of me. <laughs> and so there was a couple of times when they were just a few inches from me. <laughs> Um, and I felt like once or twice, they maybe didn't notice me sitting there because this may be a little unusual for someone to sit on that corner. Um, but I felt like I began to become a, a bit a part of the fabric of that spot after a while. Like there's the same loud vocal guy kind of speaking with different people in different spots throughout the day. Um, at one point there was like a dog owner um, that got uh, where the dog got away from it and everyone was kind of like chasing this dog down and trying to corner it. I just like remember all these things very vividly. Um, I, you know, like the traffic, the smog, um, the bright bits of sky between these big apartments. Um, I'd like to think that in some way, um, all of my experiences from that day are kind of ingrained into this work. Uh, and then there was one more that I wanted to kind of point out and story tell about a little bit. I can find it. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so the last one I wanted to mention was um, this one, which is called the Wicked Big Cafe, uh, which is it's funny because in spite of its name, it's really not big. It's, I mean, you know, I guess it's a good size for a little kind of hole in the wall spot. Um, but this is in uh, Haverhill. Um, it's my, my personal favorite um, out of uh, my body of work today. Um, it's uh, since I moved to Salem, New Hampshire, um, Haverhill has become my kind of go-to spot for inspiration. It's very dynamic. It's bursting with character. I really adore the old brick mill towns around here that have all kind of sprung up along the Merrimack River. There's, you know, there's Methuen, Haverhill, there's Amesbury, Lowell, Lawrence, there's Nashua, New Hampshire, Manchester, I think, Manchester, New Hampshire, not to be confused with Manchester by the sea. Um, and like the North End, you can feel the history when you're in the space. Um, this cafe had kind of a refurbished chic vibe to it, if you will. Um, but more than anything, it was a warm space on a really frigid day last February. Um, you can maybe tell that it was around Valentine's Day because if you look closely, you can see a chalkboard um, sandwich board with little pink hearts drawn on it um, as like, you know, they were advertising some Valentine's Day related hot drink or something. Um, 
I've been feeling that fierce kind of painting bug nagging at me as a result of that sort of wintertime cabin fever. Um, so I went to this general neighborhood, layered up probably six or seven layers. I had like hot hands in my gloves and hot feet in my boots, uh, thinking I was going to sit outside in, you know, like 10 degree weather, which wasn't realistic. Um, uh, but I drove by this building, which is kind of a weathered old brick building um, that drew my attention very quickly. Uh, and I headed in partly because I just wanted to try the hot cocoa. Um, and when I came in and I saw this really warm sunlight pouring straight down through the windows you see in the painting, it really entranced me. I probably looked a little strange just standing there to everyone else. Um, there happened to be a tall seat by the window. So I sat up there and I tried to start painting discreetly. Um, I wondered a lot about this guy that you can see towards the back of the space, which, you know, um, he looked definitely like a, a blue collar worker of some sort who perhaps had a few hours to spare. And he was sipping on a big cup of coffee and he was knee deep in a lot of big textbooks and just so as I was painting and trying to make sure he didn't notice me um I was just kind of wondering like what his story is what brought him to this cafe what he was studying like you know I wonder if he's studying like something like business management like if he's you know lining up to become the manager or the owner of whatever business was advertised on his like big black hoodie uh or if it was something like he's you know, um, aspiring to break into some completely unrelated thing, and he has to go back to school for whatever it is, uh, which a lot of my a lot of a lot of people our age have kind of had to go through at least one major career change like that, and it always means more education and more study. Um, and this guy was just very quiet and diligent and focused the whole time, and so he. Uh, he made a great subject and, and the space inside this cafe made a great subject. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about my work here. I mean, I could keep talking for, you know, another hour, but I don't want to take up everyone's time, everyone's whole evening. Um, thank you for showing us everything. If you wanted to like head over into Kyung's area, and you could just pick out a few photos and can you can talk about your work and your inspiration and stuff yes. like that. Yes, absolutely. Let me just, my connection's a little bit slow. Um, should I start? Yep. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, it's really nice to meet you all today. My name is Kyung and uh, I took all those photos in France and I took a winter session travel course in Paris from January 2020 to February 2020. So for the course assignments, I went to Paris, Lyon and Annecy in France to spend the days waiting for the good moments with different, different angles of the photos. Uh, but the pandemic has spread uh, throughout the world after my travel course. As a result, all my photos turn into my pre-pandemic moments in Paris. So uh, now our daily lives have undergone major changes due to COVID-19. And now we realize how precious our daily lives were before. So I think uh, each viewer uh, will appreciate and see themselves reflected, reflected in each pieces of work. and. Uh, each piece of work by the desire to interact with other closely and travel internationally. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kyung, were, were there certain paint, uh, photographs that you'd like me to navigate towards? Uh, maybe the subway one. Oh yeah, sure. That's... Yeah, I think that one is really like pre-pandemic moments in Paris. And the kids one as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
lost them, sorry. Um, would you like me to um, stay focused on a couple that you um, that you wanted to talk about, or would you like me to just kind of go through um, the gallery? Yeah, sure. yeah. Just, could you just go through like any work? I don't yes, think. So if we want to open up like the well the chat has been open so people have asked questions um so I can ask those to the artists and if you guys want um make sure to ask just questions in the chat or have comments so the first question um is from Valerie and it's for Chelsea is there an ideal city or location that you would ever want to travel to to use as reference for your paintings That is a fantastic question. Um, I would love the chance to go to pretty much pretty much any European city or town. Um, like looking at Kyung's photography actually really makes me desperately want to go to Paris because I'm sure I would just, I don't know, I, I feel like I would never want to leave. Um, uh, I, we're hoping over the next year or two to perhaps get to Italy. Um, and because I mean, you know, it's everywhere, every, every artist loves going to Italy and drawing and painting there. Um, and I, yeah, I, I would love to just, you know, move there or something. <laughs> um, and just like try to profile as many of those fascinating little nooks and crannies that are so old. Like, you know, we consider like a lot of these New England buildings to be an antique um, because they're usually like a couple hundred years old, the ones that catch my attention, but compared to anything in Italy, Portugal, Spain, France, uh, Austria, Germany, any, any of those countries, uh, you know, ours are like teenage punks by comparison. Liverpool, for example. Liverpool, definitely. Yeah, we're, we're hoping to arrange a trip down to Liverpool if, um, uh, in the next couple of months, um, provided that COVID-19 lets us. It would be wonderful. 
Liverpool also looks like a great place. Awesome. Thank you for answering. Um, Kyung, Valerie said that your photos were stunning. And also, when taking photos of people, how do they tend to respond? Do they ever like talk to you about the pictures or do some of them just simply not notice? So most of them, they didn't even like realize it. They didn't like notice that I'm taking a photos. But one time I took a photos at the at the Contemporary Art Museum in Paris, I guess, uh, I think. And then like one, I took a photos of two staff. They're talking uh, in front of the in front of the painting. It was very good like moments, and I try to take a photos. But one step was so mad at me because I didn't ask that I took a photos. So he tried to ask like he tried to like delete the photos. But I use thirty five millimeter like black and white film camera, so I can't I couldn't like delete it. So he was so mad at me. So. Yeah, I, I apologize. And then, yeah, that things happen <laughs> sometimes. Thank you for your answer. That sounds not fun, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then to you, Kyung, Jonathan Martel just said that he really likes how you captured the light coming through the bird's feathers in flight. So those are all the questions and comments that we had in the chat. Um, yeah. So if the artists have anything else to say or if John has anything to say. No, I think this was fabulous. Thank you very much to both of the artists. This was a great show. And act, so it does, we're going to keep it act live on the website till September 30th. Is that what we said? I think it's September 30th. And even then it doesn't go away. We, 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 we actually hide it on the website, but you can still find it. <laughs> um, but officially it's up till September 30th. So I think this is worth seeing. And I, I love one quote, one, there's only one quote I wrote down and it was from Chelsea. And she said, making art is very empowering for me. And so I wrote that down and it was like, yes, that captures it. <laughs> um, but we, we are, we're recording this and we're, We'll actually put this uh, recording on our YouTube channel, so we'll be able to watch it after Chelsea and Kyung act. They get to uh, say yay or nay. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you all again so much for coming. It means a lot. Thank you. Woo!